radical San Francisco district attorney, Chesa Boudin, has been recalled in a vote where 60 percent of the far left population of San Francisco removed him from the office of district attorney. You have probably heard that story, but hang in with me as I tell you why this story is more important than simply partisan politics and why this story is more important than simply the city of San Francisco. First, here's the analysis you've already heard. What a warning sign for Democrats. If Chesa Boudin is recalled in San Francisco, what does that mean for Joe Biden? What does that mean for Democrats in the House of Representatives? What kind of red wave does that predict come this November? You cannot mess with people's quality of life. There are many different issues within this country where we have honest disagreement with one another, different ideological prisms, different solutions for how you handle a problem. But one thing that crosses party lines is you cannot mess with someone's quality of life. What does that mean? Well, the most obvious one and probably one that's going to really make Joe Biden pay the price is in someone's pocketbook with economics. Look, we're looking at a national inflation rate of well over 8%. We're looking at national gasoline prices well over $5 a gallon. This hurts. This supersedes partisan politics. This motivates people to cross aisles, and this motivates people to vote who otherwise would not see themselves as political. Why? It directly impacts their quality of life, as does someone's children. There's nothing more important to us than our children. Any parent would back up that claim. The money and the economics are in service of raising our families. Don't mess with our kids. Otherwise, you will end up like school board administrators in Loudoun County, Virginia. Take our kids into the classroom and teach them that they should see the world through the prism of race. Take our kids into the classroom and preach them that gender is a social construct. And you are going to end up with a school board meeting full of angry moms. Don't mess with people's kids. Don't mess with their quality of life. And then, most apropos to this conversation, don't make people fear for their life. Crime is on the rise across this country. Every form of crime, almost every form of crime, robbery, burglary, theft, transit crime, small nuisance crimes like graffiti or vandalism, dangerous crime like murder up across this country. In San Francisco, the quality of life had become visibly deteriorated. You could see syringes on the street corners. You can see human excrement as the city streets are used as a toilet. The homeless problem is out of control and people simply do not feel safe. All of those same crimes I just rattled off on the national level are particularly pronounced in San Francisco. And the district attorney in San Francisco, Chesa Boudin, had taken on a policy and political position that really honestly isn't particular to the far left city of San Francisco, doing away with cash bail, looking to prosecute crimes at lower levels than felonies, not using gang affiliation as an enhancement when it comes to sentencing, sentencing more lenient in general, not prosecuting misdemeanors often at all. This Manifested in people seeing that individual were walking into Walgreens or CVS or Dwayne Reed, which is in New York City, and stealing everything, stealing deodorant, stealing toothbrushes, stealing whatever. Walking out, no harassment. Security guards told not to interfere. Store clerks told to cower behind the counter. While those thieves literally took the stolen wares out onto the street corner and created pop-up markets to compete with the store they just raided, of course, at an undercut 
price because their cost of goods was zero. So this was directly impacting San Franciscans quality of life as it is people across this country. And this is the analysis that you have probably already heard. Joe Biden's approval rating, according to Real Clear Politics, is now down to 39.7%. If they're recalling liberal district attorneys in San Francisco, what will happen in Pennsylvania? What will happen in Georgia? What will happen to the White House? In two and a half years, anticipate an absolute bloodbath, anticipate a red wave this November, and one to soon follow in 2024. But here now is the analysis that is the story behind the story. We've often asked, and recently in our last episode of the Will Came podcast with Matt Walsh, how much of what's happening in this country is attributable to Elite and powerful individuals manipulating our culture versus how much is a perversion that is bubbling up from the ground is a grassroots flow of culture is the American political and societal culture just an uncontrollable stream flowing down the side of a mountain or are there individuals throwing up dams and throwing up levees? to direct the stream in some pre-designed directions. Well, let's talk about Chesa Boudin, the former district attorney of San Francisco. I think what you'll see here is a story that you might not ever have encountered in real life. Chesa Boudin is the grandson of an attorney in New York City who represented Fidel Castro. He was born into a family lineage of radicalism, you know, even in the 50s and 60s and certainly by the 70s. Fidel Castro was a controversial figure, a known communist, a revolutionary. It would have taken an outlier in America, an outlier attorney, to take on the representation of Fidel Castro. But the radicalism didn't stop at his grandfather. Chesa Boudin's mother, Kathy Boudin, was an absolute radical who attended the Little Red Schoolhouse in Manhattan. This is a private school for the aristocratic left, the elites, who quite honestly are raising children in open Marxist ideology. And it worked because Kathy Boudin went on from the Little Red Schoolhouse to study Russian, Russian studies at Bryn Mawr College. After that, and this is still during the 1960s and 70s, keep that in mind, she went behind the Iron Curtain and studied at the University of Leningrad. This is not simply someone interested in Russian literature. This is not simply someone who's looking to be worldly and understand other cultures. This is not 1996. This is in the 1960s. Going behind the Iron Curtain to study in the Soviet Union was to go study with the avowed enemy of the United States of America. From there, Kathy Boudin came back to the United States of America. And in 1970, she was in a townhome in the West Village of New York with several other individuals where they were building a nail bomb a nail bomb that was intended to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey to explode and to kill American servicemen. These would-be terrorists were more ambitious than they were competent, and the nail bomb exploded in that West Village apartment. It ended up killing one member of a group of people who went on to be affiliated with the weather underground. Kathy Boudin, for what it's worth, survived that blast. Apparently, reportedly, her clothes were completely blown off of her body. But she went on to meet a man named David Gilbert. Now, David Gilbert studied at, at in Chicago for the Students for Democratic Society. The Students for Democratic Society was a socialist 
small C communist organization that splintered and went on to form the Weather Underground. The Weather Underground was a terrorist organization as designated by the FBI. Now, Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert had young Chesa Boudin, but their family as a unit didn't last for long. When Chesa was 14 months old in 1981, Kathy and David took part in one of the most notorious robberies in American history, an armed robbery where they served as the getaway drivers with five members of the Black Liberation Army. This was the ultra-violent wing of the Black Panthers. Here's what happened. The Black Liberation Army soldiers ended up robbing a Brinks truck. They came out guns blazing. They killed one Brinks truck security guard and, according to the New York Post, blew the arm off of another. They grabbed something like six bags of cash, and David and Kathy, serving as the getaway drivers in a U-Haul truck, took off. They were identified, and the NYPD set up roadblocks and flagged them down. When they flagged them down, Kathy jumped out of the passenger seat of the cab and took off running. She was eventually caught by the police. Meanwhile, back at the U-Haul, the five members of the Black Liberation Army decide they are going to go down in a blaze of glory. So when the NYPD manages to open the trailer of that U-Haul, they come out guns blazing. Two members of the NYPD were murdered. Kathy and David went to jail. David Gilbert and Kathy Boudin went to jail for participating in an armed robbery that resulted in murder, driven by not greed, but their political ideology, leaving Chesa Boudin orphaned. Now, listen, I do not believe the son is guilty, nor should pay the price for the sins of the father. I certainly don't think the son is guilty or should pay the price of the sins of the grandfather. I believe we are individuals with agency and should be judged as individuals according to our own character, our own decisions, our own actions. But these are the waters where Chesa Boudin swam. These are the ideas that he was handed, and he did not reject those ideas, nor did he stop receiving a constant stream of these radical ideas. Why? Because who adopted Chesa Boudin and raised him but Bill Ayers, one of the leaders of the Weather Underground, again, an FBI-designated terrorist organization. Bill Ayers, by the way, um, was one of the leaders of the... Weather Underground, when they bombed the United States Capitol, bombed the Pentagon, tried to create a revolution, later would reach national pop culture significance when it was a political campaign issue that Barack Obama had connections to Bill Ayers in Chicago. We should put a pin in this for one moment and address our current political climate. Last night, the January 6th hearings began in primetime on Capitol Hill. The January 6th riots, the riots, were a particularly shameful chapter in recent American history. There were many honest protesters that day, and that's the truth. That's not an equivocation. There were many who committed minor acts of vandalism or trespassing. And there were others who absolutely rioted and deserve some punishment. I think for a future conversation, we should talk about the extent of that punishment and whether or not, as people are still in jail to this day, the punishment has fit the crime. However... As we see January 6th turned into an absolute political football, one that is designed to paint 
a political movement in America first, a political candidate in Donald Trump. And increasingly, 50 percent of the American population as, quote unquote, insurrectionists. I think it's fascinating how little attention and interest there is in actual insurrection. We don't hear much about the weathermen or the weather underground or Bill Ayers or the Black Liberation Army. Odds are you haven't heard that. Now, why is that? Is it because it's an unimportant chapter in American history? Why is it that Bill Ayers goes on to become a collegiate professor? Why is it Kathy Boudin, before she died, by the way, ended up being a professor, I believe, at Columbia University? Why is it we're so forgiving of individuals who commit violent acts in the name of a political ideology? How is it that is not insurrection worthy of attention? But January 6th is worthy of boxing out anything else that would ask for our attention. Like this, just this week, a 26-year-old man named Nicholas John Roski from Simi Valley, California, was arrested in Washington, D.C. for an attempt to assassinate a Supreme Court justice in Brett Kavanaugh. Roski traveled to Washington, D.C. with a pistol, a tactical knife, a tactical vest, and various other gear with the intent, purpose of killing Brett Kavanaugh. Why? Because Roski says he's upset that the Supreme Court could overturn Roe v. Wade, which it has not yet. And again, in a conversation we should delve into further, that threat, that potentiality, should absolutely sit on the shoulders and the guilt of the Supreme Court leaker who you did that with the express purpose of manipulating the Supreme Court justices under the threat of public pressure, or in this case, assassination. But you would think this political violence, which literally happened within the last two days, would command some attention. It hasn't. Name your mainstream newspaper, name your mainstream cable channel, and they saw this incident as a 6th page, 17th page, 26th line item on the web page type of story. It's enough to make you wonder whether or not we're dealing with honest actors, isn't it? You know... It's enough to make you wonder if any of the conversations over and under the guise of bipartisanship and common sense and and, and seeking solutions are actually honest efforts. You know what's interesting? What happened in Uvalde, Texas, which, by the way, also apparently served as one of the motivations of Nicholas John Roski's assassination attempt, Odd in that see a mass shooting, decide what you then must commit is an assassination. See a mass shooting, attribute it to the proliferation of guns, and in response to that, take up a gun to kill a Supreme Court justice. But you know what's interesting? In the wake of one of those kinds of incidences, it was predictable, and in some cases, it is an honest attempt to solve a problem from people with whom I have disagreement. But why is it, for example, when a bunch of Republican congressmen are attacked on a baseball field with an AR-15? Do you remember this happened a few years ago? Steve Scalise, congressman, Republican congressman for the United States of America, was shot, in, ended up in critical condition. The weapon of choice in this shooting, this politically motivated shooting, was an AR-15. Why in the wake of that incident were there no calls for gun control? There weren't. We didn't have a big national debate about gun control. There was no big effort to introduce a new bill. I'm not playing apples and apples or apples and oranges. I'm not comparing travesties. I'm just asking, are we dealing with honest problem solvers? Are we having an honest conversation? Because if we were, you would think 
all tragedies would command the same solution you tried to advance in the wake of this horrendous tragedy. If we really were worried about insurrection, we would worry about the progeny of radical terrorists who bomb Capitol buildings. If we were really worried about insurrectionists, we'd pay attention to assassination attempt of a Supreme Court justice. It's enough to make you wonder, are these honest concerns seeking honest solutions? Now, finally, the story behind the story behind the story. How do we as the United States of America end up with the radical son of one-time terrorists as the district attorney in San Francisco? We do that through a concerted effort. This is where the stream is directed by levees and dams. This is not a natural progress of grassroots, ground-up American culture. This is at the manipulation and guidance of American elite. George Soros has funded $40 million over 10 years in electing district attorneys who share the ideology of Chesa Boudin, not in San Francisco, but in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Dallas, in New York, in Los Angeles. George Soros has funded over the campaigns because district attorneys are publicly elected through the democratic process, has funded the campaigns of 75, successfully, 75 district attorneys through either direct funding or infrastructure groups funded by George Soros. That adds up to half of America's 50 most populous cities. That adds up to 20% of Americans living, as do I, in the city of Dallas, under the influence of a district attorney backed by the money of George Soros, meaning policies developed through think tanks, policies pushed through the power of money down to the local level that includes eliminating bail, dismissing felonies, pushing for lighter sentences, and pushing harsher penalties onto law enforcement. That shows up in your daily life. That has shown up in my daily life. For some reason, if I point this out or if you point this out, you're immediately called an anti-Semite for showing the political influence of George Soros. I care nothing about his religious affiliation. I care nothing about his race. I care nothing about his ethnicity. I care nothing about his age. I care nothing about his influence over the American political process and the direct effect on our quality of life. I'll just tell you this, and I haven't gone into this story deeply, and I'm probably not going to ever. I'm not going to right now. But my family has been someone who has experienced crime, crime on the home front. Do you know what I was told by Dallas Police Department? There's no point in pressing charges. He'll be out in 24 hours. There's no point. And if I told you the details of the crime, you would be appalled by that prospect. Why do you think the Dallas police understand there's absolutely no chance that he will pay a penalty? Because ultimately, a prosecutor will dictate what crimes receive what punishments. And those district attorneys are receiving money from organizations funded by George Soros. And those organizations believe in these ideas and these ideas deteriorate our quality of life if they can recall these ideas in san francisco we can recall these district attorneys in st louis in new york in chicago in dallas and in los angeles where george gascon will be the next person to potentially face accountability if we understand the power and the influence of the story behind the story behind the story story number two i am fascinated by the live new golf tour 
This is the golf tour funded by the Saudi Public Investment Fund. This is petrodollars from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the royal family of Saudi Arabia, who has put $255 million into eight tournaments that includes guaranteed money for the world's biggest golfers in an attempt to bring them over from the PGA. And it has worked. Big name golfers, including Sergio Garcia, Dustin Johnson, Phil Mickelson, Kevin Na, Patrick Reed, Bryson DeChambeau, Louis Oosthuizen, Lee Westwood, Ian Poulter, and possibly Ricky Fowler have decided to join the Live Tour, whose CEO is Greg Norman. Now, this particular golf tournament and the decision of these golfers has drawn the ire of not just the PGA and not just fellow golfers who've decided to stick with the PGA, but it's drawn the ire of almost universally the entire sports media industry. Now, I find this fascinating, and I want you to walk through this with me, because what I see here is enough hypocrisy to put a pox on everyone's house, including mine. And so let's have this conversation honestly. Here is the argument from the vast majority of sports media. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia deals in dirty businesses. They're accused of human rights violations. They have been at times accused of being an avowed enemy of the United States of America, although they have a very cozy relationship with some of the most elite families and oil companies in the United States of America. There are and have been questions and investigations even around the Saudi relationship to the 9-11 terrorists. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is, as one particularly loathsome sports writer, the Ellsworth Tui of sports writing, Richard Deich of The Athletic, a country that deals in blood money. It is true that the Live Tournament and the investment of Saudi Arabia through the Saudi Public Investment Fund is to, in essence, sports wash their image on the world stage. And it's not limited to golf. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia just bought Newcastle United of the English Premier League, and they will turn Newcastle United into one of the top soccer clubs in that country. Instead of a middling Premier League team, in a matter of years, you're going to start hearing about Newcastle in the same class as Arsenal and Manchester United and Chelsea and Manchester City. Manchester City, my favorite team, backed by UAE oil money. Here's a question. UAE has also at times been accused of human rights abuses. Am I supposed to take a moral stand against rooting for Manchester City because they take money from the UAE? Now, on the flip side of all of this condemnation when it comes to sports writers, you will have guys, and he's a friend of mine like Clay Travis, say, well, if any of those sports writers were offered $100,000 more – to continue doing the job that they're already doing, but that $100,000 was coming from Saudi Arabia, they would take it. And he's probably right. And I would say, you know, are we as sports fans supposed to be the moral barrier for the decisions of our athletes? But hold on now. Hold on. Let's check our own hypocrisy. And put everyone's in check. Because those very same sports writers up in arms about Saudi Arabia and the blood money going in to the Live Golf Tournament are completely silent when it comes to the NBA and China. They have very little interest in pointing out the human rights abuses when it comes to the Uyghur Muslims and the concentration camps in China. They have very little interest in condemning LeBron James in the same way they're willing to condemn Phil Mickelson. So the entire sports media complex is 100% hypocritical why i honestly on that one i do not know is it because they want to protect the pga and the nba is the favored child so call it out one way but not the other but if we're being fair that hypocrisy works in reverse as well and he's my friend and i would say this to him clay you have a lot of condemnation for the nba and lebron james and their relationship with china why are you forgiving of phil mickelson and all of the other 17 golfers who have chosen to join the Live Tour 
when it comes to their business relationship with Saudi Arabia. Wouldn't consistency require us to hold the same position on both of these issues? For what it's worth, by the way, it's called live because it's Roman, um, Roman numerals for 54. There's going to be 54 rounds in this tournament, or 54 holes, three rounds, 54 holes, 48 players on this tournament. The money is staggering. Dustin Johnson reportedly was given a $125 million contract, not just to join, but to be sort of a public face, an advocate for the Live Tour. Tiger Woods was reportedly offered huge nine-figure dollars to join Live, which he has not yet accepted. I find this hypocrisy enough to go around for everyone. And I come back and I ask myself, Am I a hypocrite? Not because I'm excusing any tour players from leaving the PGA for the live tournament, but I would certainly condemn LeBron James for his relationships in China while rooting for Manchester City, backed by money from the UAE. Am I a hypocrite? Here's where I come down on all of this. Sports fans, in the end, aren't there to impose their morality on their entertainment product. They simply aren't. And they haven't been for a long time. That's the truth. Should or should we not be? That's a separate question. But we are not. We are there to be entertained and to win. The fact that Manchester City is backed by the UAE means that they acquire better players and they win. And it's a lot of fun rooting for them. Am I supposed to treat my sports fandom like my outlook on theology? Am I supposed to think deeply about something that in my estimation is an escape for us to enjoy shallowly? Sports is an escape. Sports is about enjoyment. I think every sports fan is looking at it through an appropriately superficial relationship. But You know, I watch Survivor as well. You ever watch Survivor on CBS? I'm always irritated by the end of Survivor when the jury comes out and they start criticizing the players for the way they conducted themselves and they went back on their word. Because you're sitting there saying, what are you doing? This is a game. The entire game of Survivor is to outlast, outwit, and outplay. It's not to outmoralize the other players. Why do they take the real world and impose it on a game? I don't think the game is supposed to reflect. And maybe I'm being hypocritical now because I want my children to learn the values of merit and character and resilience through the prism of sports. It's why we play sports. It's what I talk to my sons about. I don't want them to be cheaters. And it's not about winning at all costs. But do you holistically impose your entire moral worldview on something that's simply there beyond your control, and there for fun. I don't know. On one hand, I think that we should have sports completely separate from politics and from the travails of the world, because I know that, like, from a health perspective, human beings, we need that escape. We need something that we can enjoy superficially. But on the other hand, should we be giving our dollars to someone who not just hates us, but might be actively working for our own destruction. Maybe you can make that argument when it comes to Saudi Arabia. You could certainly make that argument when it comes to China. It's not fun to give your money to, for example, say you're a Golden State Warriors fan, but you're opposed to gun control. Say you're a Golden State Warriors fan, but you're opposed to far-left progressive politics. It's not fun to give your money to someone that, at least on the surface, acts as though they hate you. In Steve Kerr, but it's even worse to give your money to someone who's actively plotting to destroy your country in China. Look, I can't make sense of all the hypocrisy. This is where I come back to, and this is where I land. If this is going to be a superficial world, the world of sports, if this is going to be a place for entertainment, if this is going to be a place for escape, and that is a fine answer as far as I'm concerned. If that's what sports will be, well, then it cannot be a one-way relationship. What I mean is we cannot, as the inter- 
entertainment consumers come there under the pretense of escapism entertainment and be forced to accept the moralization of Greg Popovich and Steve Kerr and LeBron James and Colin Kaepernick. We cannot have the relationship be that we give our dollars in exchange for their sermon with a side order of basketball. That's a one-way relationship if we're not allowed to look under the hood of where the money is coming from. If you want to moralize to us, then we should be capable of moralizing to you. If you want to preach to me about the inherent nature and evil of race in the United States of America, then I should be able to ask, how's that money from Chinese concentration camps going? That's the two-way relationship. If you want to be a celebrity entertainer and have our relationship exist in the world of wins and losses, then I can accept you taking money from Saudi Arabia. I think in the end, the only way I can make sense of all of this hypocrisy is to say our relationship must be reciprocal. It must be two-way. Otherwise, we're going to have to look under everyone's hood. Story number three. Speaking of sports, Jack Del Rio, the defensive coordinator of the Washington Commanders, has said he doesn't understand how there's so much attention today on the Capitol riots of January 6th and so little attention on the destruction of America. Listen. There here you can hear Jack Del Rio describing January 6th as a dust-up. By the way, in response to that, a Virginia state senator said he will be voting no on the stadium proposals for the Washington commanders to relocate to Virginia. This is, of course, so predictably. In fact, when my producers sent me this story, I said, oh boy, here we go, because you knew where we would go. This is, of course, pr- provoked the condemnation and ire of the entire sports media industry and not just the sports media industry. Ibram X. Kendi, of course you know Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, the beating heart morality of anti-racism, the intellectual center, the dysfunctional brain, of anti-racism, tweeted the following. Among the 7,305 demonstrations in the summer of 2020, 96.3% involved no property damage or police injuries, according to researchers. But anyone who has the audacity to call a dust-up at the Capitol doesn't care about data or accuracy or truth. Okay. Ibram X. Kendi says to you that the protests in the wake of the BLM movement were 96.3% peaceful. No property damage or police injuries. This is a tweet, an intellectualization of the CNN banner of mostly peaceful protests. I have no idea whether or not Imram X. Kendi's numbers are correct. And I don't think I have to, to point out this shows you that the intellectual center of anti-racism is an unfolded lawn chair. Broken straps, the kind you sit in, your butt sinks in in the summer. What happened to this chair? It's broken. The intellectual center of anti-racism is broken. Let's take his stats at face value. Wilfred Riley, who's been here on the Will Kane podcast in the past, he's a college professor, took Kendi at face value. He said, let's just take these figures at face value. That means 263 of the protests were violent riots. He's doing the math on the... 3.7% left over of Kendi's wave of the hand at 96.3%. All told, $2 billion in damages was done, and about 30 people were killed. We broke that down here on the Will Cain podcast in the past. It was probably a good year ago. The fallout from the BLM protests of 2020, the property damage, the small businesses, the streets burned to the ground. And the people who lost their lives. Here is Riley pointing out at least 30. Kendi's own stats indict the BLM protest. Certainly in comparison to the quote-unquote dust-up 
at the Capitol. Certainly, when it comes to property damage and the loss of human life. But to take this conversation full circle where we began, it's interesting. What gets attention and what does not? Isn't it enough to make you wonder, are we dealing with honest problem solvers? Are we dealing with honest contributors to this conversation? The Washington commanders may pay the price for Jack Del Rio's statement. He's walked it back a little bit. Everyone always does. They're forced to. And look, Jack Del Rio has a head coach who has a general manager, who has a president of operations, who has a team owner. And as we've talked about in the past, there's no such thing as FU money. No billions. They'll save you from, I need this stadium. We'll see where Dan Snyder comes down in support of Jack Del Rio in the coming days and year. But as the nation turns its attention, I guess, let me rephrase that. As the media turns its attention and attempts to turn your attention to what it deems the most important issue facing the United States of America, not inflation, not gas prices, not crime, not what just happened in San Francisco, not what's happening in your city or what's happening behind the story, but what happened more than two years ago on January 6th. As they attempt to turn your attention to that, I think we can once again ask one more time today, are we dealing with honest problem solvers? Are we dealing with honest contributors to this conversation? All right, that's going to do it for me today here on the Will Kane podcast. It's always been good hanging out with you. Go check it out. I'm pushing to get more of these episodes up on Rumble. There are many episodes up on YouTube racking up big numbers. We're not even 24 hours into our episode with the Matt Walsh conversation on what is a woman and it's come roaring out of the gates on youtube you can watch that conversation and leave a comment i read them there's something like three thousand comments and i read them i'll be honest not every one of them but i scroll till i'm tired i read them everywhere facebook twitter and i appreciate your five-star review all right i'll see you next time hey it's will kane Click here to subscribe to the Fox News channel on YouTube. It's the best way to get our latest interviews and highlights. And click to subscribe to the Will Cain podcast for full episodes right now.